that uh, word for today, I, 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 it's very up to date, isn't it? The word that we need for today. Well, happy July the 5th. I hope you've had a good weekend. You know, we, we uh, I mentioned the 9 o'clock service. We went from fireworks to mask this year. <laughs> but I understand that a lot of people just sat in their backyard and all their neighbors were buying up the fireworks and putting them off. So we, I guess we had fireworks again. So uh, I, I heard on the news that they, they spent the, uh, three times as much on fireworks this year than they had previous years. Isn't that crazy? Because they weren't going to have their, the big ones, so they, they got them for their homes. But that's the United States. We live in a great nation, right? Amen? We enjoy it. On the very first mission trip I went on, I went down to Mexico with a group of about 35 of us. And uh, we flew down for a week. We went through Mexico City down to Chiapas, down in uh, uh, the far ends of, of uh, Mexico, almost to Guatemala. And so we got on the bus. We came into Tuxla. We got on the bus and went to San Cristobal de la Casas, the city of the mountains. And we did vacation Bible schools there. We did uh, evangelistic services. I was able to preach in one of the services. And, and we ministered to pastors and local churches and we had a wonderful time. But one of the things I remember about that trip is when we flew back into the United States and we touched down, when, when the plane touched down in the United States, there was just a spontaneous cheer by, it seemed like all 35 of those missionaries that went down to Mexico, we just clapped and we cheered. Not that we had landed safely, but that we had landed back on United States soil. We were so happy to be home. We were glad we could go in the name of Jesus to share the gospel of Jesus, but we were so glad to be back home. I'm glad to be in America. You know, over the years, I, I, I've seen through the media all kinds of protests. I, I lived when they were burning flags and when they were burning draft cards. I lived when they, they raised their hands and they had black gloves on and they raised their hands at the Olympics. I, I saw that on the media. I lived, that was in my lifetime. I've seen them kneel at the National Anthem. That's in our lifetime now. I, I, I've seen them boycott the 4th of July just yesterday. And that's, I've seen so many protests in my lifetime. And I'm not here this morning to say that I disrespect protesters. That's not my purpose. But what I am trying to say to you is it's not my thing. I'm glad to be an American. I'm glad to live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I'm grateful for the benefits we have of the, in this nation. I'm grateful for the leadership that has got, brought us to this point. Even if there's flaws in our nation, I'm glad I'm a part of this nation. I'm glad for those that have given their lives, who, who've fought for our freedom, who's given us all the kind of benefits that we have. I'm grateful and I'm glad. As a Christian, I believe we ought to be a good citizen. I believe you ought to be a good citizen no matter what nation you're in. If you're a United States citizen, you need to be a good citizen. As a Christian, you also need to be a good citizen of the kingdom of God. Once you become a, a Christian, you're not only a citizen of the United States, you're also a citizen of the kingdom of God. That, that video was talking about how he gives freedom and, and heavenly citizenship. And you have responsibilities to both your nation and the kingdom of God. What I want to do this morning is as we think about our independence and, and what we have as a nation, what I want to do is I want us to think about our responsibilities and our benefits of the, this nation and how it's even better in the kingdom of God. Let's think of one particular benefit that we have, and, and that's freedom. 
freedom. We are the land of the free, and I believe that. I believe we have more freedom than any other nation. I believe we have freedom to, to do things that no other nation would, would allow its citizens to do. And we have, have uh, constitutionally rights that, that defend our freedoms. One of those is seen in, in uh, the Bill of Rights, the very first one. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. I think it's pretty neat that the very first Bill of Rights is about our freedom to, to worship like we do. But it goes on to say, are bridging the freedom of speech or the press are the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And there, there's more of those Bill of Rights, but that's the very first one. And it's an interesting the freedom that we have to assemble, to peaceably assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. We have people that obviously have grievances today. One of the great things about this nation is they can go and petition. They can protest. You know, there's hardly any country in the world that would allow the kind of things that goes on in our country. And it's because we're free. We're the land of the free. We have the freedom of religion. We have the freedom of speech. We have the freedom of the press. Freedom is a wonderful gift. And you know, in, in a real sense, our freedom didn't come free. It was, it was fought for over the years by me to keep us free. And it's a wonderful thing to have. It's a wonderful gift that we have as a United States citizen. But here's the thing to remember. The Constitution does not provide for the freedom of humanity's greatest enslavement need. Let me say that again. The Constitution does not provide for the freedom of humanity's greatest enslavement need. I want you to listen to John chapter 8. These are, this is a conversation that Jesus had with the Jews. In John 8, 31, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in Him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does not remain forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. There is a slavery that the Constitution does not touch. There is a slavery that no human ability enables you to be free from. And it's a slavery of sin. See, Jesus in this conversation makes it very clear. He's talking to some interested Jews. It says Jews who believed in Him. That they basically are, are believing what He's saying up to, up to a point. Some will follow, continue to follow Him, some won't. But up to this point, they're liking what He says. But then some of the other things He begins to say, he, they begin to question. And one of them is their freedom. He said, you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Well, what did they not like about that? They, they, they didn't like the fact that he was saying, you're slave. He said, we've never been slaves. We're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves. Of course, they didn't know their history very well because of Egypt. They were slaves to Egypt. But they were overlooking that fact. And they were thinking, you know, but we're free already. We're free already. And then Jesus clarified they were talking about physical freedom and not spiritual freedom. They were talking about physical slavery, not spiritual slavery, because Jesus said everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. 
That's the slavery that it captures every human being. Anyone that commits sin is a slave to sin. Now, slavery is a horrible word. Because it's, it's a horrible thing to take the freedom of a person and, and, and take it away from them. Whatever the circumstances are, it's horrible. But anything that physical slavery can do to you, spiritual slavery can do more. You say, you say, man, you know, it can't be worse than physical slavery. But spiritual slavery destroys your relationship to God. Sin destroys your relationship to God. Sin distorts your man humanity. Sin affects your eternal destination. Physical slavery is while you're here. Spiritual slavery is forever. And so we see the consequences of, of being a slave to sin. And who is that? Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Who is that? The Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone's thought something or said something or done something that displeases God. So we're all sinners. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. What does that mean? Every humanity that's ever sinned, and that's all of us, has become a slave to sin. That's the words of Jesus. He lived in a day that there, there was slavery. They knew what slavery was. They knew what slavery did. Spiritually, we need to understand what's, what this being a slave to sin means. In the book of Romans, Paul addresses people about the consequences of sin on the first half of the book. The, he, he does it. The first three chapters are basically looking at every type of human being in every kind of circumstances and showing that every one of them, no matter where they're born, no matter what their religion, no matter how they live their life, they are a sinner. That's the, con that's the conclusion after three chapters of looking at different kind of people. The conclusion is every one of them are sinners. So we don't have to ask ourselves, wow, I'm glad he's not talking about me. Yes, he is. We're all sinners. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And then in Romans 6 and 7, he begins to describe what it means to be in bondage to sin. He uses the word slave. He uses the word domination. He uses the word you are instrument of sin. He uses the word you're under the control of sin. That sin is your master. That he uses that word that sin is your master. And most people, you know, they don't think from a spiritual perspective and they go, nobody's my master. Spiritually, if you're a sinner, you're, sin is your master. According to the word of God. If you don't believe that, argue with God. Because that's what He said. And so we see that this is this consequences of sin is terrible. Paul said, because of sin in my life, and he's talking in a personal experience, at the end of Romans chapter 7, he begins to say the things that I want to do, I don't do because of sin. It controls me. The things... That I don't want to do, I do because of sin. It controls me. But then he moves into Romans chapter 8, which begins to change the thought and begins to change the, 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 the message of, of Romans. And he says in Romans 8 too, he says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and of death. Jesus alone is our Savior from sin. Jesus alone can, can make us free. We're slaves to sin. There's only one freer. Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Only Him. Only, we need to understand, there's only one Savior from sin. From, 
slavery of sin. In September the 22nd, 1862, Abraham Lincoln wrote the Emancipation Proclamation where he declared all men to be free. Abraham Lincoln is not the emancipator of slavery of sin. No human being, no government, no constitution, no bill, no rights can free you from the consequences of sin. There's only one emancipator, and his name is Jesus Christ. You shall know the Son, and the Son will set you free. That's the, that's the Word of God. We get so confused a lot of times, just like the Jews were confused in the conversation with Jesus. And they, they said, we're not, we're not slaves. We've always been free. And most of the world is saying that we, we're not slaves to sin. We've always been free. And the Bible clearly says if you commit sin, you're a slave to sin. And you need to be saved from sin through Jesus and Jesus alone. And that's the freedom that He gives. The United States offers freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of the press, but they cannot give you freedom from the slavery of sin. They cannot give you the ultimate free, freedom so you can be physically free. You can enjoy the freedoms of, of this life and yet not be free indeed. You shall know the Son, and the Son will make you free indeed. He gives you the ultimate freedom. And it comes only through Him. It's only through Jesus. I like the movie Braveheart. Braveheart is a kind of a historically based movie on the Scottish rebellion in the 13th century against English oppression. And uh, it's about a man by the name of William Wallace, basically. A real historical person. Mel Gibson played him in, in, in the movie. I loved it. I liked it. A lot. And one of the lines that I really enjoyed was when he's getting the, the, his troops ready to go into battle against the overwhelming odds. And he yells out to them, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. People have been fighting for freedom for years. People have been longing for freedom for years. And I'm telling you that we can have the ultimate freedom through Jesus Christ. God Himself has provided His Son to die on the cross that you, whoever believes in Him, can be free indeed. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. So we enjoy the freedom that we have in this nation and we're grateful for those that have made it possible for us to have that freedom, but we understand that it falls short of the, the ultimate freedom that comes only through trusting Jesus as Savior and Lord. So we're grateful for freedom. We're also grateful for provision and protection. You know, I, I believe that there's no nation that pro provides for its citizens and the opportunity that it, better than the United States. I, I, I don't believe there's any nation that protects its citizens better than the United States. I, I believe we're blessed that way. Now, I'm not here to put down other nations. Nations have a lot, there are other nations that have a lot deeper, longer history. When I went to uh, the best university in, in Florida, Florida State University, <laughs> everybody agree with that, huh? I, I got some uh, uh, discontent in the group. But I did go to that university, so uh, I have to be a Seminole um, by choice, by the way. But I, when I went there, I took a social studies education. I, I could be a, a teacher if, if I, by the degree that I got, and I majored in world history. 
Uh, so the idea was I could have been a world history teacher. Uh, and in the process, I studied a lot of nations, the history of a lot of nations. Uh, and, uh, you know, and they have rich histories. So they, you know, some of the times it was, it was filled with flaws and wars and all kind of problems and oppression and everything else. But it's rich history with rich culture. Uh, I took humanities classes, and in the humanities classes, it showed that many of the arts, and many of the accomplishments that we have, much of the music, much of the classic music comes from other nations. So I'm not saying other nations have not contributed. I'm not saying other nations don't have wonderful heritage and cultures and, and histories. But what I am saying is, that I'm, and I'm biased, that I believe our nation's better. You know, in, in the sense that it provides militarily and economically and even culturally advantages. And so, as I said, I'm biased, but I, I appreciate what is provided for in the nation that we live in. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. We're, we need to be grateful for the fact that we live in a nation that has so many opportunities uh, for advancement, opportunities to provide for our families, and protection. Protection. So our, our nation provides and protects in a way that I don't believe that other nations can. But how about the kingdom of God? Is God able to provide and protect even better? Of course. So we need to understand that as a citizen of the kingdom of God, that we have something that is beyond what the armed forces of our nation can do, the law enforcement of our nation can do, the leaders of our nation can do, as much as they do for us, it goes beyond that when we look to God and see what He does for us. Let's talk about provision. In Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Now, in Philippians 4, 19, and my God will supply all of your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Provision. How much more will God, the provider, enable me to live the kind of life that He wants me to live than any other human being or any nation can do? We talked about it, I think, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about God as our Father. and That because of sin, and once again the consequences of sin, that we have been kicked out of the presence of God. Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden. We've been kicked out of the presence of God. And even though we enjoy all the general blessings that God offers in this world, we don't have the specific blessings of Him as the Father until we come to salvation in Jesus Christ. And at that point in the time in our life, the Holy Spirit comes in, and we have that introduction that it speaks about in Romans chapter 5, and, and that, uh, that access to God that it speaks about in Ephesians 2 and 3. So at that point in time, you become a child of God. You become a kingdom of a citizen, a kingdom of a citizen of the kingdom, let me get that right, a citizen of the kingdom of God. And along with that citizenship comes the responsibilities of living as a kingdom citizen, but also the privileges. I now have access to the Father. And the Father owns it all. And I'm His child. And He will provide no one can provide for you greater than the Father. And He is the one who loves you more than anything else. Not only thinks of your physical needs, but your spiritual needs, your emotional needs. He, it says He will supply all of your needs. 
What are your needs today? A lot of times it's not just physical needs. He will supply all of your needs. Who can say that? Only God. So when it comes to provision, it's like God can is the ultimate provider, just like Jesus is the ultimate Savior, the ultimate freer. What about protection? In 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 5, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. It's talking about born again believers, Christians. And he goes on to say, who are protected by the power of God. Through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Who are protected by the power of of God. Who's protected by the power of God? These born again believers. You know, we live in a nation that's, that, that's awesome. We live in a nation that has the most powerful army. And because of that, we, we've not had a lot of the problems that, that other nations have had. Some nations have gone through wars to where they've just been bombed and bombed and bombed. We've really been, we, we've had experiences like Pearl Harbor and 9-11. But as far as just being bombarded and, and vulnerable and exposed, our nation has, has protected us. We've got, I believe, the mightiest, strongest, greatest army in the world. And it protects us. But God is the ultimate protector, not only of the body, but of the soul. And, and if it came down to saying, what would you like mostly protected in your life? Your soul or your body? You better say your soul. Because that's eternal. And who is the protector of the soul? God. What is he talking about in, in 1 Peter 3? He's talking about you've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You've been born again. You've been saved. You've, you've had this new birth. And so you, you have this promise that goes with this new birth that you're going you're gonna to live an abundant life here. You're going to live an eternal life in heaven. But that's yet to come. It's, it's a salvation to be revealed in the last time. There's, there's a salvation out there when Jesus ultimately defeats sin that is, is waiting for us and we haven't got it yet. And, and what's happening between now and then? Are we vulnerable? When you become a Christian, are you vulnerable? Is somebody going to come and take that away from you? Is somebody going to take away all the promises of God? Is, is, are you vulnerable? Not according to the Word of God. It says He has. Uh, an, a, you're going to obtain a inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And notice what it says: who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So I become a Christian. My ultimate salvation is when Jesus ultimately defeats sin and it's out there somewhere. Am I vulnerable? No, I'm not because I'm protected by the power of God. Isn't that amazing? That's the promise of God that you have. As a citizen of the United States, you are protected by all the forces that are available to the United States. You basically have that promise. You can claim. You go to a foreign nation. You can call upon the United States and say, and I need your help. You have the protection of the, of the, of the nation with the mightiest army in the world behind you. And so you feel secure. I feel secure. 
But I know that there are times that, that, that vulnerable possibly. But when I accept Jesus Christ and God becomes my protector, the protector of my soul, that's the ultimate security. And it comes from God. We're grateful for the nation that provides for us. We're grateful for the nation that protects us. But we understand that the ultimate provision and the ultimate protection and the ultimate freedom comes from our relationship with God. Now, I'm glad to be in America. I say that proudly. And I, I, I feel a responsibility to be a good citizen. But my highest loyalty is to God. I'm glad to be an American that has provides freedom and provides for my safety. But my ultimate trust is always in God. Always in God. So I, I think at a time like this as we think about our nation and what it means to be a citizen of the United States, I, I really believe that, that we need to be grateful. I think that is an emotion we need to be grateful. If you have grievances, you have the right to petition. But this nation provides for us things that no other nation can. But we need to understand that even as great as our nation is, it cannot provide for our salvation. It cannot set us free from the slavery of sin. It cannot keep our souls safe until we're uh, saved, ultimately saved at the end of time. It cannot do what God does. That is who is the one that we ultimately trust in. And we have a relationship through Jesus and Jesus alone. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for our nation.